well, what can I demonstrate that may be interesting to you? And um, I've gotten a lot of um, questions in the past about the surface that I use when I, um, not all the time, but frequently when I do stills, I create uh, a textured surface. Uh, and um, I sort of enjoy that for a couple of reasons. I started doing it uh, when it was shown to me in a workshop. But then I realized that um, I used the Reeves BFK printmaking paper, which is available at any Blix store. So if you're out of paper, you can just go down to the store and get some. You don't have to order it and wait for it to come to you. And the same thing with the, um, the golden pastel ground that I use, uh, also available at Blix. You can just go and pick it up. So being somebody who doesn't necessarily plan in advance, it's a go to that you can just, oh, I need this certain size. I'll just go and pick it up and do it um, rather than having to plan ahead and wait for it in the mail or whatever. Uh, so that's what started me on it, uh, planning. And then I just kind of, <laughs> I kind of enjoyed the service. But you'll find that a lot of the things that I've discovered um, and used is because I, I'm impatient and I don't like to wait for things and um, I just like to get it done. So I, like I said, I use the Reeves BFK paper. Um, I like it because it comes in huge sheets, 26 by 40 or something like that. And so you can cut it to whatever size you want. Uh, and I, I tend to use, um, odd sizes, I, I, you know, like nine by 18 or, or something strange. And so you can just cut it to whatever size you want. And I have uh, discovered that not only, you know, again, I don't always have a surface that I can lay things out on and cut with a, an exacto blade. You can tear the paper and it gives it a nice edge. So. You can lay it on the floor with a straight edge and just tear it into the sizes that you want before you put the ground on. I have a question. Reeves BFK printmaking paper. And I use the golden ground for pastels. And this is another thing um, in various classes that, that I have taken, uh, people dilute it. So if you want a smooth surface with ground on it, you can put water in it and, and you get a smoother surface. But again, because I'm impatient, I don't want to deal with that. And I discovered that I really like the texture that you get if you use it just straight out of the, the um, bottle. So I just take that and slap some on the paper. You can tint it with acrylics if you like. You can mix it up with your acrylic paint and, and make whatever color you want to the ground. Again, I'm impatient. I don't want to do that. But I like a, a colored surface. So I just take the pastel. I might want to make this background for a purplish. So I just take a purplish pastel and I shade and I put water into the ground that I have locked on my paper. And I paint it around. And as you're painting, it mixes it, it mixes the color in. <laughs> I, guess, I guess I invented it. Yeah. Um, and so right now it's kind of a soft ish gray. I might want a little different. So I'll take a different one a little bit more in. What's the name of that paper? It's Reeves BFK printmaking paper. R I B E S. 
and then the initials BFK. Now you could use any paper. Another thing that I've discovered that's now turning darker. And I'm not going to worry about if it's blended in very much. I kind of like the fact that it's a different shade. Um, and so I just paint it in any which way so that it covers the paper. You can use more than one color. You can do all sorts of things. You can do a drawing underneath and paint over it. And if you don't, you know, put too much color in you and you use it straight from the can, um, you, it will be see-through and you will be able to see your drawing underneath. Um, you could do a painting underneath. One thing that I've started doing is recycling old failed drawings. So if something, you know, I, again, this is like money saving. It's like, I don't have any paper. I don't want to buy any paper. What paintings do I have? Now that I've been doing it for 10 years, I have ones that like, why in the hell did I do that? <laughs> you know? And so I just, I take it out and whatever paper was on it, I just paint over it. And, um, this dries fairly quickly, which is why I'm doing it while I'm talking, because it's getting a little stiff. But you can see that, that I haven't paid any attention on what I'm doing or how I'm going. It has marks in it. Some of the color is thicker in other areas. Um, and that's okay. The way it is. I've also discovered that if you have it on a surface like this and you kind of go off of the surface, it sticks it a little bit to the surface around the edge so it doesn't curl up as much. But I found that it doesn't really curl. Um, I'm not, there are some people who absolutely have to have a pristine flat piece. And they and that's why they use boards or they uh, adhere their paper to a board and that kind of stuff. <coughs> that has never bothered me. I don't care if it's edges are warped in any way. Um, so I don't worry about it. But it, it does turn out to have a really nice quality to the paper because the paper itself is sort of thick to begin with and the, the ground on top of it, it, it it's almost like leather when when you finish with it it has a really nice heft to it and it um, has a nice feel to it I feel like I have a question over there the ground is uh, I I generally use a brush because I like the brush strokes. I've tried it with a roller, and it gives a very even texture to it that I didn't like. You know, I, I did try it. Um, I'm going to this brush is like a cheap brush that I bought, and um, probably because. After you use the ground, you should wash it out immediately. Um, I probably won't be able to use this brush again. I can wash it out. Yeah, you're going to wash it. You don't have to. No. Okay, it's, it's a girl thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a girl thing. Okay, it's not. We need to We need to clear So if you're going to be. Right. If you if you do your Mike was saying that if you do your drawing on the paper before you put the ground on, you can make your strokes go with what you feel like your drawing is going to look like. Um, you know, I haven't done that so much because I kind of like the the spontaneity of having to to work with whatever is there. 
and um, sometimes it works with your drawing. Sometimes you'll, you know, sometimes you weren't expecting it to, but it really works with the drawing. So I brought some examples of ones that I were doing, and I, I, um, this is this is a, a promo for uh, Bernard's plein air. We we did a plein air outing. And I am not very successful with plein air drawings. The, the, the drawings that I, that I did while we were outside were not very good. I didn't, you know, they were okay, but I didn't like them. But one of the things that that did was inform my color choices. So that when I went back into the studio and I started working from my, my photographs, um, I wasn't stuck with the colors in the photographs. I had already done, you know, I had my pastels that I brought with me and I had chosen ones, you know, outside that seemed to be the right colors. And I worked with those so that that when I was working from my photos, I thought, well, forget, you know, the photo says that, but I'm gonna do this. Um, so I did these little explorations and I'm not sure that, you can have um, bringing it up close to the screen so that people can see how the the brush strokes work. Um, you know, all of these marks were in the ground before I started, and I didn't know what I was going to put on it until after I started painting. But you can see that the brush strokes seem to work with some of these. Yes, so um, this one here was a failed drawing that I brushed over and um, Mike was asking if I had used it on sanded paper and this, this particular one here is on a piece of, I can't remember what kind of sanded paper it was, but I, there was a painting underneath it that I didn't like and I brushed over it and did this one on top. So you can see how the brush strokes in the ground add interest to the, you know, the mountains and, and stuff without even me having to try to do anything. So sometimes, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. In this particular, this particular one, it worked very well. Yeah. Um, this one I wanted to show because this also was um, a painting that, that I didn't like and I painted over and I cut it up into pieces and I ended up with this piece and you know that painting that I painted over and was underneath it kind of gave me the idea to do this one. So this is what it looked like um, before I started with just the ground, clear ground over the failed painting. And um, this is what it looks like afterwards. And again, the brush strokes on this really helped with the, the waves. And then I brought this one, um, I've discovered that that using this surface really works well in landscapes because you have all of this stuff going on that you you're tempted to draw every single little blade of grass or whatever because it's so interesting. But if you do that, it lacks the the I don't know the spontaneity of nature. You know, it's like it's just happening out there, and you can't really capture that. And so if you're using this textured surface underneath, you can really get that. And I think that some people um, also use it for, you know, like they'll start a painting and then they'll have like a grass area in the foreground or something. You can put some of this on and then do, do it over that. So it's only like in a section of the painting and the rest of it. Um, but it's not, a technique that works so well with a lot of detail. And fortunately, I don't do paintings with a lot of detail. 
but um, I've noticed with uh, with portraits and stuff, you get some kind of weird marks and stuff. But it, it can work, and so I, I brought this one to show that um, even doing figure, um, you know, if you just do it with like suggesting the figure, suggesting the pose, um, you can use the texture. And I particularly brought this one because for making, you know, things for the background, if this were just a, a, a regular surface, you would have like a block of color and it wouldn't be very interesting. But because you have the texture and the layers of color with the texture, it just makes that, that surface in the background look so much more interesting than if it were just a block of color. And this one I had to you know, work with with the marks that were there to get the figure to come out without a mark coming through and distracting you. But it seemed to work pretty well. And there are ways that you can fill up the, the, the texture with a color uh, if you don't want to know, if you don't want to have it noticed. Um, and you can just leave it if you. Marty has a question. You can ask questions, sure. The question was, what, what do I do? Do I put a uh, drawing underneath? Do I paint underneath? Do I, uh, you know, how do I do the layers? I've done all sorts of things like that. I, I don't usually draw on the paper before I do a, a painting over it, but I do paint over paintings that sometimes show through and inform what I want to do um, underneath. I have also done things like just put down, and this I got from Dawn Emerson, where she puts down textures in with using a brayer and different things. And I've done that underneath, just put marks on in ink underneath and do this over the top and then see what it, it suggests to me to do. Um, Sue has a question. Right. You, there's a lot of things you can do with adding it to paintings that you've already started or, um, you know, as you're painting along, uh, just to add some interest to it. I sort of like having it, um, you know, not no thought into what goes underneath and then have to deal with it as I'm doing the painting. So I um, I thought I would work on a painting here to show you some of the techniques that I use to get different effects. And I brought in a uh, photograph from the mountains. You know, that's just simple. You probably can't see it. I have it sketched out here on, on top of this. And this is a a ground that I just put down, similar to the way that I did the sample here, where I, I put some uh, color into the, uh, the gesso before I started and then just put it on any which way. Um, one of the things that I've discovered that I, I, I don't think that it works very well with skies and clouds because this, Skies and clouds are softer than, um, than this. And since I haven't done any, you know, I suppose we could do some of the mixed, like, you know, when we do it in the areas where the, the mountains and the grass and the lakes are, but um, I didn't think of in advance. So I thought, well, here I have this whole surface that's textured. How can I get a smoother sky? 
And so one of the things that I've discovered is that if you put the color down, and I'm going to start with a darker color than we want, because I kind of like having some of the darker show through. Um, but if you put color down, and then you take one of these hoosers, my favorite thing that, that Don Emerson, you know, turned me on to, um, she calls them swishers, so that's what I call them. It's, it's a, a very dense foam that's used for insulation in buildings. Um, I don't know where you get it because I got it for home deep. Yeah, yeah, I think you, that, that you get it in big sheets, you know, and can cut it up. If you get one of these smushers and smush it into the groove, you get a surface that's not picking up the textures as much, so it's like solid underneath. Just like that? Well, except that one of the yeah. After I'm done, you can come up and feel these. They have a they, they have an even denser texture. And what I like about them also is that they don't absorb any liquid. So after I'm done, I can just wash it off. And it and in a minute, five minutes, it's dry again and I can use it. Um, and I think that the the magic you know, the magic eraser sponges will absorb water, you know. And this does not, it's so dense, it doesn't, it's very smooth, it doesn't absorb water, and it lasts forever. Um, you can also do this, though, the smushing thing with the regular sponges that you can get at the dark. Um, and I think it is very cool. So a little lighter. And this is the technique I like to use if I was starting with a, with a dark, Brown, and I want to make it more. I use this machine. White. Now I have experimented with using different colors of paper and just using the, the clear or you know, slightly opaque brown on top of it. Um, and that's interesting. It's all interesting. I, you know, I, I believe in experimenting just to see what you can do with different things. Now, what I also like about this surface is that you can use the internet to keep me on to change as well. So say I want this to be darker, and I like using the, the, the wet medium um, for Or making things darker underneath. Yeah. So I can see this as well. I like to use alcohol because it dries faster. But you can use water and you can use anything you want. And we can just wet it down. And what I like 
you know, whenever I'm doing stuff. So I don't care what's underneath. You know, I just kind of smush it around in any which way that I do. Um, because you can always cover it up. But sometimes you get some interesting things. See what it is. I've shown you the time you get the lighter color, smooshing it in, get the darker color. Um, I do a wash and lump, put in the paint underneath. You take this surface that you prepared, and you could do, you know, your your value study, a tablet underneath, and paint it over or or whatever. Um, and then you could go on and then put dry a little bit. Um, oh, the things that it, you know, I said it doesn't, as in my opinion, it doesn't work as well for sky. Although I've done, I've done sky and cloud studies, it, it gives it a very um, impressionistic kind of movement to the sky, but sometimes when you want just plain soft clouds and sky, it doesn't work that well. But I, I really like the way it works for water because it gives you uh, depth to it. So for instance, on this particular one where I did the water, uh, the under underneath was very dark and so, and that's, you know, the way that water is, it's not, you know, you, the depths are dark and it's light on the top. And how do you get that, that layering effect? It's hard to get. And I find that using, uh, using this method, you can, you can see the, the dark peak through and you can just be very soft on top and put, you know, uh, uh, soft layer on top and you'll see what's underneath. Uh, so it, it, I think that it works well for, for different kinds of water. The same thing here, where um, the foam on the, on the water, you know, is just on the top and then underneath it's like dark. And so you, and it's, um, it's bubbling and, and it's not any kind of pattern to it. And so the texture that I put underneath, uh, it helps me get that feeling that uh, it's flowing because there's texture happening underneath that I have to deal with. And, and it seemed to work in that particular one. And in this one, you know, there was movement to the, the water and that gets picked up. Um, I haven't, as I generally, I generally start out with with either dark or medium color. Frequently, it's because I painted over a painting, and whatever was on it before um, becomes the ground, and so it's some kind of medium gray when you once you finish mushing it up. But um, I have started with with white underneath, and. Um, and then put color on top and 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 done the wash on top. Um, I I have some I can't remember the brand anymore, but I have some chalks that are like the same shape as Taylor's chalk, and it's like a water soluble um, colored pencil, but in a shape that's square like this. And I like to use that sometimes to do my drawing. Um, they come in uh, a black, gray, and white, and they also have like a earth tone set, you know, going from dark to uh, a lighter yellow. And I like to start with those and just kind of sketch in the drawing and then take the water 
and um, and wash it out and see what happens. So I've done that on a surface that's either white or or like off white you know, paper so that you can get the different colors. So I've done that. Um, but um, again, the touch that I use when I'm I I start out very soft. So you might not be able to see this, but if you if you just start out soft, you can sort of see where the lines are going, and if you if you want to use that or not. Anybody, even people here, can't see it. Yeah, so the directions of the brush strokes will come out. Um, And leave the um, whatever is underneath. Underneath, and it gives you a sort of guideline on what you might want to keep and what to use, and what you might want to fill up, so that you don't see the strokes. And, um, So this is what I was showing them, uh, how underneath was the screen, and I just lightly put the blue on top to see what I was getting here, and, and uh, do I want to keep that or, or not. Um, in the mountains, I have to see, because the mountains tend to go down, and the brush strokes are going across on the mountains. So, this isn't necessarily bad because if I do, if I if I'm not using the textured surface, and I put my you know if I decide to go down on the mountains, it can be monotonous. You know, it's just down, 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 down. But because the brush strokes are going crossways, then it'll pick up little striations in those you know downstrokes that I can decide to keep or not to keep and it'll make it more interesting more like rocks actually happen where you'll have a rock slide coming down but it will actually be a layer the rock is actually going sideways um, even though it's the tendency is to fall down the mountain so it can be helpful in those ways um, It's mostly randomly, you know, it, it, it starts out random. I don't have any idea, you know, like if I did this, I just painted it on any which way. And that's exactly how I do it. I have, you know, I, I take a bunch of different sizes of paper. I just go out in the backyard and I you know, slap stuff on them. I have no idea what I'm going to be doing with them later on. You know, then as I choose them, that's when I start making the choices. So I may have this piece of paper um, that has brush strokes going on it this way. And I might say, well, you know, the painting that I want to do, it would work out better if, if the brush strokes went this way. And so I'll choose to do the painting with on um, this piece of paper going, going this direction. You know, and that's my choice. Started out random, but then I choose. Okay, I'm going to do this way. Um, this particular piece of paper has strokes going all sorts of different directions. 
the ones up at the top were more were smoother going across, and I decided when I that I would make that the sky because it was smoother. That there's some weird things happening down here, and thought that it would be more effective to have that in the water. So I made that choice. It started out random, but then I start choosing. So every time I put a layer on. I'm choosing what to keep and what to, to leave. So the, there's a randomness to it, but then it informs your choices. And I kind of like that, that push and pull, that if, if, you're, if you don't have that randomness, um, it's hard to get vibrancy, you know, at least for me. Know other people are better at it than me uh, than I am, but uh, it kind of forces you to be looser, and um, and then you can be surprised by something. You know, that there might be a happy surprise in there. Oh, this works really well. You know, I'll keep that. You know, but if you don't like it, you can always cover it up. Um, and I wanted to also show how you can cover things up. So I'm going to put some stuff down really hard here. I'm not this demonstration is more than just demonstrate technique. It's actually come up with a finished painting. Um, but here I may have lost some of the texture and um, I want it to come back. Um, how some of the texture has been lost in some of these areas because I put a lot of half uh, um, down on it. So, uh, yeah, so you don't like But if you don't like that, you want to bring it back. There's a couple of ways you can do that. One of which is to take a blade and just scratch it off. Then you can scratch with the grain of the texture. Then it will bring out some of that. Um, you can, you can, oh, some of these areas have to be you can just like scratch off whatever you put on. You can also take something like a, co a colored pencil um, and go back in there and follow the grain. Yeah, you can use any, you know, for, for this particular, the harder the better, because you're trying to, you know, scratch through that layer of, of, of pastel that you, you put on, and, um, and, you, and you might want a finer point. And so if you use a, a colored pencil, you have that, that point that will scratch through. And, um, and we'll bring out, bring back some of that texture that you may have lost. You can do either. You know, it sort of depends on what you what you want um, for that. If you go against the grain, you know, going against the grain actually works fairly well for um, if you have grass that you want in and you want to put some interest in there. And so you you can put a line in that won't be a solid line because you're going through grain and um, just different ways of making it uh, 
loser without having to do it yourself. You know, it forces you to be a loser. So I want to show you. It also uh, gives you, when you do that with the, with the pencil, I feel like it gives you sort of sometimes two things. You get two things. The ink sticks a lot. Why not? I, I, I pretty much just demonstrated the different things that I do. Not that I wasn't you know, doing this to finish anything. See if uh, maybe I'll just do this one more. Maybe they can get the raffle going while she's doing it. Right? Um, I think it works. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have any more techniques to show. You can, you know, all of the things that that I'm doing here, I've done in these paintings. And so now that you've seen, you know, now that you've seen me working on this, you can go back here and see maybe what I've done on these particular ones. I have a question on hard versus soft pastel. So at the very end, like the flowers, you're using very soft, or are you using soft throughout? I'm using soft throughout. I'm using both throughout, um, you know, the soft pastels work very well for uh, on this chemisa. Um, if I went when I went in and uh, did this final layer of, of this, I used very soft on the top. So the soft pastel will sit on top of the, the grain. Unless you smoosh it, you know. So I use the soft pastels also for for this when we want to smoosh it in. Um, and I often will, you know, if I'm not satisfied with a particular area, I'll just take a smoosher and smooch it. And then it becomes like a field again. So this one, you know, now that mountain is a little bit bluer and lighter underneath, and then I can go in with another pastel on top, and the same thing will happen. We'll pick up this striation and leave a different color underneath. So you get all that interest without having to draw it in. So that's that's basically the technique that I use. And I I encourage everybody to play. You know, I think that, that that's 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 my final thing. You know, just do it and see what happens. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kathleen, for that excellent demonstration and. Uh, you know where you can reach out and talk to Kathleen if you have any questions. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed that um, for our, those that have joined us on the computer.